Hello everybody and welcome to class 15 of user experience design. In this class, Jen's first foray into video lectures, we're going to talk about wireframing. So what is a wireframe? I know this is something that you discussed last semester in your course with Barb, but I wanted to take a little while to talk about my interpretation of what a wireframe is so you know what I'll be expecting from you. When I introduce wireframes to a new client, I usually tell them to look at a website or a mobile app or any piece of software and try to imagine what it would look like if you take away all of the colors, you take away all of the specialized fonts, you take away all of the images, graphics, and photos. What you're left with is a wireframe. You can also think of it as the underlying blueprint for a software product. Wireframes show navigation and orientation, so how your product is organized as well as where you currently are in the product, the important content, and the layout of the screen. So some examples. If you look at the website first of all, imagine if you took away the colors, you took away the fonts, you took away all the images and graphics, and you're left with something that looks like this. So once again, it shows the navigation structure. It shows where you are in the structure. We're currently on the home page, so none of these areas is going to be highlighted. It shows you the important content and the layout, or where things are placed on the screen. Here are some other examples from your lecture from Barb from last year. So what do wireframes tell us? Well, they show us the information architecture of the website or app. In other words, how it's organized. They also show us the interaction design, or what happens when I touch it. We do this by ordering wireframes. So you have one wireframe and you would specify, okay, now if I touched on this part, and then you would show the next wireframe in the sequence. And they show task flow. We're going to talk about this a lot more in our next lecture, but task flow is essentially the order in which you do things. We want to make sure that the order in which our personas want to accomplish their scenarios matches what they see in the wireframe or on the screen. People generally like to do things from top to bottom, from left to right, and as I mentioned before, we'll talk about um, having the wireframes ordered in the correct sequence so that when you touch something, what you see on the next page actually happens in the order it's expected to from your personas. So why do we use wireframes? Why not just jump to coding? Or why not just jump to a visual design with all those lovely colors and fonts? Well, there are a couple reasons. So first of all, they're a very inexpensive, low-risk way to design products. It's quick. You can try a lot of different things quickly and easily. You can compare those designs and you can iterate your design options quickly or that is make changes to them to make them better. See how it is and then make some changes again. They're very easy to change because oftentimes, as we'll discuss, you use just a pencil and paper or maybe a whiteboard and some whiteboard markers or maybe a software product or two to make these. But unlike coding, which can take a long time to make changes, if we have uh, something that we need to fix and we've drawn it with a whiteboard marker or with a pencil, it's as simple as grabbing an eraser, erasing the part you don't like and drawing it again. Very inexpensive and low risk. So if you remember this screen from way back in the second week of our course, it talked about why we use UX design because it saves money. So a dollar spent to fix a design issue in early design for every dollar spent there during development would cost $10 to fix and after release would cost $100 to fix. So wireframes are what make the $1 fix possible. As I mentioned, if you're working in paper and pencil, it's as simple as getting an eraser, erasing what you don't like, and redrawing it. So another reason why we use wireframes, uh, why not do a visual design? Why do it in black and white as opposed to in fancy colors? Well, 
If users can't figure out how to use it when it's in black and white, no amount of visual design, colors, fancy buttons, nothing is going to help. I've conducted countless usability testing sessions where the next step is to click on a button on the screen. The button could be big and red and highly stylized, but if it's in the wrong place on the screen, participants never find it. We need to make sure we get the design right in black and white before we go and start applying styles. Another reason why we like to stay away from visual design elements like colors, styles, images, and fonts is because they tend to bias our design options. When we're looking at different design options we've created, we want to evaluate these based on the appropriateness of the language or the wording used on the screen based on the layout or where we've put different things on the page. We want to evaluate based on the navigation model, how we allow people to find different parts of the software. And most importantly, we want to evaluate based on interaction strategies, so how users will input information and how the software will communicate output back to the user, as well as controls such as buttons, fields, drop-downs, search boxes, sliders, switches, pickers, we want to make sure that we've picked the right controls to get the job done. On the other hand, if we jump straight into a visual design, it's likely that stakeholders or other people who are helping to make the decisions can become biased by the presence of the visual design elements. So instead of evaluating each design based on elements that affect the usability and the ease of interaction, They'll instead be ha saying things like, ooh, I like the purple one, or ooh, I really don't like that font. The colors and the fonts are irrelevant. Any color, any fonts can be applied once we make sure that we have the correct language, layout, navigation model, and interaction strategies. So, I know you guys are anxious to know what you're going to be doing on the project, and we'll talk about this in more detail next lecture, but briefly, when, when, when you're wondering what wireframes you create, you're going to be taking a look at your usage scenarios you've defined, and you're going to design only the screens that are necessary for your personas to complete their key scenarios. That's why we write scenarios. Don't worry about this too much for now. We'll talk about this more later. So, wireframing tools. What do I use to actually make these wireframes? You've got a lot of options. There's the old-fashioned model, which is pencil and paper. A lot of people like to use a whiteboard and markers. And there are a lot of software products available. For example, Balsamic, which you have access to by following the link, just like last semester. A lot of people like to use PowerPoint or Keynote, believe it or not, for wireframing. There are people who do like to use Illustrator, as well as all sorts of specialized wireframing software that's available out there, such as Exure, UXPIN, Mockingbird, Indigo Studio, um, a free web-based app called Evulus Pencil you can check out, and many, many others. I thought you guys might be curious to know what actual designers use, so I did an informal survey on LinkedIn, pretty much just said, hey UXers, what tools are you currently using for wireframe? And believe it or not, the majority are actually using a whiteboard with markers and a camera to take pictures. A close second, we've got Balsamic, Illustrator, and Exure, which is a pretty expensive, pretty full suite of um, tools. A little bit overkill if you ask me, but we'll talk about that soon. A lot of people are using pencil and paper and a camera or scanner to get into the computer. PowerPoint, which we'll talk a little bit more about when we get into templates, and as I mentioned, a variety of other software tools. So there are templates available. I know you discussed this a little bit with Barb. For example, uh, when it comes to wireframing on paper, you can actually print out um, images with the actual size outline of a device uh, so that you can just fill in your design on the page. There are stencils, a little bit overkill for us for the moment, but people do create custom stencils so that you can just sketch what size you need for the screen and start filling it in. There are also templates available 
in the digital realm. For example, this is a screen grab taken from a PowerPoint presentation with a whole bunch of different elements that you might need. So if you need a button, if you need a checkbox, a radio option, tabs, text field, a combo box, etc., etc., you just copy the element you need and drop it onto the page that you're working on in PowerPoint. I'll provide links to where you can find these as well as posting a bunch of them up to Canvas in the module that, uh, that this lecture is contained in. So here are some links. Uh, this is a really great resource over here um, for principal mobile sketching templates. Uh, these two links are to get to um, the PowerPoint templates that you saw on the previous slide. It's a little hard to find them on the actual screen, so I'm also going to include the actual PowerPoint files for download for you on Canvas. And I believe Barb discussed last year a site called Keynotopia, which has got tons of mockups and templates, and you can download these free if you tweet. So what tools do I recommend that you use? Well, I'm going to tell you that I believe at least that low tech really is best for a lot of reasons. And by low tech, I mean a pencil and paper or whiteboard and markers. Most of the software that you'll see on the market right now is actually meant for something called interactive prototyping which is something a little bit different than wireframe. An interactive prototype allows you to create a clickable prototype. So you can create your wireframes and then select hotspots on the screen and link these together in the correct flow or sequence to really make a whole bunch of things possible. However, wireframes are not actually meant to be working prototypes. So this really is overkill. It's meant to be a fluid presentation of the high-level structure of your application. As I mentioned before, we are only going to be creating wireframes to support our scenarios, so there's really no need for an interactive, clickable prototype. We know already the order that the wireframes are going to need to go in. We create those wireframes, we put them in the correct order, and then we can step through the scenarios for each of our personas. Software tools for wireframing, or really interactive prototypes, allow you to create high fidelity prototypes with style sets and colors. But this is actually visual design, when what we want to do is wireframing. Okay? Doing visual design rather than a wireframe really gets in the way of the creative process, because it can take you a long time to create something really nice looking and high fidelity with cool colors and graphics. Or even if the cool colors and graphics aren't there, we'll talk about in a moment how it still takes a lot longer to do it uh, using a software product versus a low tech method. And it gets in the way of the creative process because, because it's taken you so long to create it, you're really not as likely to create lots of different sketches to try a whole bunch of different design ideas before settling on the one you want to use. So it gets in the way in the design process because first of all, you can't quickly try out a bunch of different options. It's also uh, an issue when you get a visual that really could be used for an actual design because when you ask people to take a look at and critique your designs, they really think that they're looking at a specification versus a sketch. And as a result, they only end up critiquing maybe some minor points rather than discussing the appropriateness of major aspects of the design, such as the layout, such as the content, uh, such as the navigation structure or the controls you've used. So really do get in the way of the design process. And as we've talked about before, having a high fidelity prototype with styles and colors can also bias the different design options. As I touched on just a moment ago, software tools take a lot more time to use. First of all, it takes time to learn how to use the product in the first place, and then time to master it so you can be as effective as possible with it. Think about how quickly you can draw something on paper in, say, five minutes, versus using software. Well, first of all, you'd have to create a new project, decide on the right library to use, 
choose all the nice little rectangles or the controls, figure out where to find them on your canvas, drop them onto your drawing surface, connect them all together, rearrange it all to look a bit nice. Suddenly, 30 minutes are gone. You could have drawn it on paper in much less time. Paper is fast and cheap. Everyone knows how to use it. There's no ramp up time involved. You can design things anywhere, on the bus, in class, at home, when you're out with friends and yeah, an idea strikes you. Doesn't matter, you don't need to be sitting at your computer using a software program. It's highly interactive in that we can show it to our friends or our colleagues, mark it up with comments, and really all you need is an eraser to make changes. It's just easier to quickly sketch out different designs and iterate or, or make changes or tweak the designs until you converge on something that looks really great. So what are best practices for wireframing in terms of the tools you use? I recommend that you complete all your early design activities using low-tech methods such as paper or a whiteboard. So when you're brainstorming, when you're doing ideation sessions where you're coming up with lots of different ideas and all your initial sketches, you really don't want to be moving to a software product at this point. When can you use to a software product if you choose to use one? You can do it only after you've sketched out all the main elements of your design and they seem to be working well for your scenarios. Okay, so you have a navigation structure that you're happy with, a layout that seems to be working, content that makes sense, you've chosen your design patterns in terms of interaction and structure, and you've created not just one, but a few paper wireframes that you're happy with. You've stepped through your scenarios, things seem to be working, you think you're really onto something that will work. At that point, and only that point, if you choose, you are ready to switch to a software product. So, that's all the information I'm going to throw at you today. What am I expecting you to do now? Well, you've got an assignment to work on and some suggested readings to look at. So. First of all, you have a practice wireframe assignment. First, you're going to choose a software product, so a mobile app, a desktop app, a website, really anything you want. You're going to choose just one screen or one view. You're going to get a piece of paper or maybe use the whiteboard at the front of the class if you'd really like, and you're going to draw by hand a wireframe just for that one screen. Once you're happy with your hand-drawn wireframe, then for step three, you can choose a software tool and draw that same wireframe using the software tool. And this is going to be due on Thursday. You can check out all the details on Canvas. And perhaps either before or after your assignment, uh, these are some readings that I recommend that talk about um, why we create wireframes versus visual mockups or versus jumping straight to coding, and also why sketching by hand is a really good idea for when you're getting started. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this lecture, I hope it's made a lot of sense, and I hope you're enjoying your conferencing sessions, and we'll learn a little bit more about how exactly you're going to design your product with wireframes next week. <laughs>